let me just take a minute to summarize kind of the course of this podcast, Brainwaves, and thank all the listeners and contributors and, uh, you know, reviewers out there who've built this into such an incredible resource for medical students, residents, fellows, trainees. We've had over 30 different contributors who've put episodes together, reviewed or vetted the content, and have spoken on the show, and we've had literally thousands of downloads, so thank you so much for your support. It really encourages me to keep putting these episodes together. Today, on our 27th episode of Brainwaves, we'll be talking about heavy metals. Heavy metal poisoning often enters the neurologic differential diagnosis when a patient presents with the constellation of abdominal pain, polyneuropathy, and encephalopathy or coma. And because these symptoms are so widespread and often the neurologic manifestations are so quickly discounted, the neurologist may not be consulted until later in the disease course or even after a diagnosis is reached. So when you encounter a myriad of symptoms with multi-organ dysfunction of an unclear etiology, this should raise your suspicion for a metabolic or nutritional deficiency, such as thiamine or B12 deficiency, a substance intoxication, and lastly, heavy metal toxicity. It's imperative that whenever possible, a thorough social, occupational, and exposure history be taken, as that may be the only reason serum or urine studies are sent for heavy metals. And with some exceptions, as we'll discuss here, most of these varying symptoms are shared by each of the clinically relevant metals. That being said, the experienced toxicologist will appreciate the subtle differences in symptomatology between both the toxin and the route of exposure. While we briefly cover the fundamental principles of heavy metal toxicity, the manifestations may be protean between the various metals, but route of exposure can dramatically impact the clinical consequences. As an example, one can be exposed to mercury either orally or by inhalation. In the case of elemental mercury, the inhalation leads to an odd encephalopathy that was first described in felt hat makers. Mercury is a key chemical in the creation and shaping of felt, and this is where the term mad as a hatter actually comes from. As a side note, Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland during the Industrial Revolution in England, and about the same time people were recognizing the ill effects of chronic inhalational mercury exposure. The same elemental mercury, when ingested orally, however, typically ends up in the toilet unabsorbed and unchanged. Another sort of mercury, mercury salts, these can cause severe GI toxicity and burns, as well as renal failure, but very little neurotoxicity. From an epidemiologic perspective, the incidence of heavy metal poisoning has fallen out in the U.S. due to raised awareness of lead in commercial paints and gasoline and other forms of heavy metal acquisition, but it's something you shouldn't forget. So, in today's Brainwaves Brief, we'll be reviewing some of the major neurologic presentations of heavy metal poisoning in alphabetical order. A is for arsenic. Unlike the other heavy metals, high concentrations of arsenic are difficult to ingest by natural means, so poisoning is often intentional. Once ingested, it's stored in the kidneys, and it's slowly excreted in the stool and the urine, but it can build up in the hair, in the nervous system, and in other organs, like the nail beds, where it appears as white lines called Mies lines, usually two to three weeks after exposure. Arsenic is one of the metals that also causes multi-organ dysfunction, with acute intoxication affecting the GI tract with abdominal pain or vomiting and cramping. It can invade the bone marrow with resultant pancytopenia, liver failure, skin manifestations with alopecia, and neurologically it produces a very painful sensory polyneuropathy, vertigo, encephalopathy, and rarely seizures or even coma. Death occurs usually following malignant cerebral edema. More chronically, persistent exposure to arsenic can cause any of these symptoms to be milder and can also cause a length-dependent axonal polyneuropathy with occasional optic nerve involvement and vision loss. Each of these manifestations are practically indistinguishable from lead toxicity, so if arsenic is on the differential diagnosis, you might also want to be testing for lead poisoning. 24-hour urine arsenic levels are checked at most centers, and treatment is similar to that of lead poisoning and involves chelation with DMSA or penicillamine. Next is lead. Like most metals, you should distinguish the symptoms of acute and chronic exposure. Acute intoxication from lead results in abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, along with encephalopathy. Seizures or even coma can occur secondary to cerebral edema as well. 
Chronic exposure of low levels of lead, as in the case of accidental exposure to lead-based paints or to certain soils, can cause lethargy, behavioral changes, sleep disturbances, and and ataxia, uh, usually related to a peripheral neuropathy, and this is what we typically see among children between 2 and 5 years of age. On the medical student shelf exam, you will typically find a question about an otherwise healthy kid who develops a subacute wrist drop. And although lead toxicity characteristically results in a motor-predominant neuropathy, often with radial nerve involvement, it can also produce a microcytic anemia, an autonomic neuropathy manifesting as constipation, and can even result in encephalopathy. Testing involves blood and urine lead levels, and the treatment of choice involves chelation with DMSA, or 2,3-dimercaptosuccinic acid, or DMPS, which is 2,3-dimercaptopropane sulfonate or penicillamine. The third metal is manganese. In the community setting, your usual patient works in an underground mine. In the hospital setting, you usually see this in patients dependent on total parenteral nutrition, with greater risk in patients with underlying liver dysfunction or biliary atresia, since manganese is almost entirely excreted in the bile. Early symptoms are recalled by the mnemonic manganese madness, headaches, irritability, hallucinations, and personality changes, along with Parkinsonian features due to basal ganglia involvement. On MRI, you see a classic high T1 signal in the globus pallidus. EDTA can be effective in treating some cases, but the underlying cause should be corrected. For instance, reducing the manganese amounts in TPN or surgically correcting the biliary atresia. Moving on to mercury, lucky element number 80 and abbreviated HG, These days, mercury poisoning is incredibly rare now that kids have stopped playing with the broken 20th century thermometers. I've already spoken a bit about mercury poisoning, but acute intoxication is similar to that of lead poisoning with abdominal pain and encephalopathy. Chronic intoxication can affect the dorsal root ganglion, the Purkinje cells, and large sensory nerve fibers resulting in a progressive sensory plus cerebellar ataxia and nystagmus. Serum and urine levels of mercury are not perfectly sensitive, so some experts recommend empiric treatment, again with penicillamine or DMSA. Thallium. This metal exerts its effects on the human body by disrupting the sodium-potassium ATPase and disabling glutathione metabolism in the liver. Now, thallium has historically been used in some pesticides and rodent poisons, whose symptoms may also mimic cholinergic toxicity. Remember your characteristic sludge symptoms, salivation, urination, defecation, GI discomfort, and emesis. But unlike the procholinergic effects of some pesticides, thallium can also cause a weakness and encephalopathy, like every other metal poisoning. Thallium is worth noting here that it produces an excruciatingly painful peripheral polyneuropathy characterized by a profound allodynia. The softest breeze going across a patient's foot is enough to cause an eruption of sharp discomfort and such sensitivity may be the initial manifestation of an acute exposure. This is much like that of arsenic poisoning, both of which can also manifest visually with the characteristically white mise lines across the nail beds in patients usually two to three weeks after exposure. Alopecia may be a delayed symptom in thallium toxicity, which follows the same time course as mise lines. Like other metals, thallium is an extremely rare cause of neurotoxicity, with only a handful of case reports in the U.S. in the past several decades. Urine thallium levels are diagnostic, and treatment involves the use of Prussian blue and or hemodialysis. Lastly, Z is for zinc, and by zinc toxicity, I actually mean copper deficiency, which is clinically indistinguishable from B12 deficiency. Like B12 deficiency, zinc toxicity with copper deficiency results in anemia as well as a nearly irreversible myelopathy. Now, I used to think that zinc and copper compete for absorption in the GI tract, but it's a little more complicated. Zinc absorption in enterocytes facilitates transcription of a protein called metallothionine, which essentially chelates the copper and prevents copper transport into the circulatory system. And due to the high turnover rate of these gastric enterocytes, the copper bound to methionine is excreted along with all of these sloughed enterocytes. Clinically, zinc toxicity slash copper deficiency presents as a sensory motor axonal myeloneuropathy, like B12 deficiency, with features of ataxia, absent or diminished proprioception and vibratory sensation, and weakness. Treatment involves the elimination of excess zinc in the diet, i.e. replacement of outdated denture cream, or supplementing the diet with copper.
So that was a pretty quick review of the metal toxicities in the nervous system. In general, heavy metal poisoning should be considered in the differential for patients with a known exposure history, such as TPN-dependent patients or minors for manganese toxicity, and pesticide exposure for thallium toxicity. Symptoms are similar across many of the metals, abdominal cramping, peripheral neuropathy, which is usually painful, and a spectrum of encephalopathy and coma. But some manifestations are more particular to each element and may increase your suspicion for a specific toxicity, for example, arsenic with alopecia or manganese with Parkinsonism. So I hope this has been helpful to you. It's certainly been a good review for me. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves, and we'll see you in a week. Thanks for listening to Brainwaves today. If you like what you just heard, you can find more related material on the web at brainwaves.me or find us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. Feel free to contact us at bweditorialboard at gmail.com. Be sure to check out our iTunes archive for older episodes. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Ars Sonor. I'm Erica Mejia. Join us next time for another edition of Brainwaves.